Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Crystal Hutchinson, and I am the ILL consultant at Central Kansas Library Systems. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and get my presentation pulled up. Let's see. Did the wrong one. I want to share my desktop. Okay. And I know I can make this little bar at the top go up so I can go down. Okay. Can everybody see my first slide on my presentation? Okay, terrific. Um, today's webinar is going to be about updated practices and procedures for using your ILL workflow when you have um, short re requests that need to go through Pathfinder Central or when you um, are filling a pending for Share It and you need to send an item out on um, Pathfinder. So for the purpose of this webinar, I'm going to refer to Pathfinder Central as simply Pathfinder. And um, I gathered this newest information uh, from a Bywater Solutions uh, blog post that they have. So I made sure to include that link in the first um, uh, slide here. Um, I wanted to make sure to also mention that although this is our updated and considered best practices at the time of 2018, uh, this does not mean that you need to change your ILL workflow or procedures at your library. If you have a method set up and you really like um, the way that you process your materials that come through shared requests, um, don't feel like this is a directive to have you change your workflow. This is just simply to show you some tips and tricks to make it easier. We're going to cover um, four points today. So the purpose of this webinar is to first show you how to check out your materials that are on your shelves on Pathfinder before you fill a pending request out on ShareIt. Um, the, and we'll actually do the process of creating a dummy account. Um, after that, we'll go through checking out an item that you received from another ShareIt library and how to um, prepare that item to give to your, pa your patron. Um, and we will actually create a temporary record. After that, we'll quickly go over the workflow differences between placing a hold on Pathfinder and making a request on ShareIt. Because when you are working on holds in Pathfinder, that is called PIL. Um, the Pathfinder Interlibrary Loan, and working and making requests on ShareIt is called ILL. So um, there's a subtle difference between both of those, and I'll kind of show the workflow and, and what is easiest for you. I'll make sure to wrap up with some Pathfinder do's and don'ts when you're borrowing from other libraries' materials here in CKLS, and also how to handle the rotating book collections. So we will dive right in with the very first slide of when you are ready to lend your item out on ShareIt to, an, to another library through ShareIt, the item should be checked out to a dummy account before putting on the courier. And I do want to mention real quick, um, all of my slides are fairly text heavy. And I wanted to make note of that because normally my slides only have about a sentence and then imagery. Um, the purpose for these materials being so incredibly text heavy is if anybody is unable to make it to the webinar or they don't have time to watch the archive, somebody could grab these slides and run through them and use it as a tutorial without ever having to watch a webinar. So that's the purpose of um, this presentation being set up the way it is today. Okay, so the situation is um, you go to share it, you log in, and you see that um, another library wants an item. So you go to your shelf and you pull it off, and now you're ready to put it out on the courier. To do that, you need to um, check it out before you send it out. And the dummy account is a patron card that is not assigned to a real patron. It's simply used to check out items for ILL. Um, one of the benefits of having a dummy account is you can typically set it up with a longer due date to reflect your ILL lending time. So why is a dummy account even necessary? Why can't we just take it off the shelf and put it in our courier bag and send it on to its, um, lending its borrowing library? 
the purpose of checking out your library materials out to an account before it leaves your library is um, twofold. The first one is somebody walks in and they search on the computer for your item. Um, the item looks like it's available on Pathfinder, and so you take a look at the call number and you go to that shelf to look for it. Um, if this item is checked out to a dummy account, it will show that it is checked out and the patron will know not to search for the item. Um, the other situation is if your patron is at home and they place a hold on an item and they think the item is available, then the following morning your, your clerk will pull all the holds and they will appear, the, the item will appear to be um, available. And so your clerk will go to that area and start searching for this item when it is actually not in your library. Um, these are the two main reasons why a dummy account is necessary. Um, one thing I will add is that there's no longer a need for more than one account. Um, old practices, we used to have Manhattan make a request, and so then we'd create a Manhattan account. And then Lawrence would make a request, so then we'd make a Lawrence account. Um, I am happy to say that at this point, there really is no need for more than one account. Um, I'm speaking from personal experience, because when I took over the ILL department here at CKLS, I had about four full, full pages of uh, patron accounts and they were all dummy accounts for ILL. Um, I was able to weed them down to just the one in-state ILL account, and that's what we check out, use to check out our share it materials. Um, the benefits of that are, are huge compared to having to deal with other accounts. Um, when um, Pathfinder was first set up, you had a limit on how many items you could check out to a patron. So you hit your limit, and then every time you needed to check out another shared item, it would pop up with a message that said, you know, you have to override this person's reached their limits. Um, now we can alter it in the back and the circulation rules so that um, you can check out up to 999 items on this account, and it will never pop up with a limit. Um, also, another reason why we used to have multiple accounts is because Manhattan would probably have an email address that you could put in, and Lawrence would have an email address that you could put in. And so if you created separate accounts, you could have the email addresses put in, and then if an item became overdue, it would automatically send an overdue notice to that library. Well, I discovered shortly after starting that a lot of our email uh, accounts were going bad. So I would get a bounce back that would say this is no longer an email and I would need to either go in and delete the account or do a search and find the correct email and update it. Um, the idea of having an email account for each of these accounts um, is far more cumbersome than it does benefit us um, in this situation. And also, sure, it does um, change materials to overdue after a certain point. So the, if a library does not get an email saying that it's an overdue, it will certainly show up on their share it side. Um, speaking of overdues, it is also so much easier for me to have all of my share it items overdue on one account. So if I had 10 items that became overdue, if they were on separate accounts, it was very difficult for me to keep track of. But now that they're all on one account, um, they, they're much easier to keep track of. I'm gonna grab a drink. Okay. The process of creating an ILL dummy account, I'm actually going to um, go through it really quickly, but then we're gonna physically create one because I have one that I need to create for a library. So um, I took a screenshot of some of our existing dummy accounts. Um, and much like this uh, clip art, um, where it says flammable, inflammable, and inflammable, no matter how it's worded or laid out, um, it, it all gets the same point across. Um, there's no right or wrong. You simply create a new patron and select the interlibrary loan type and then you take one of your physical patron cards or your library card um, and scan that number. Then you make sure to keep that card on hand in your ILL paperwork. And the next time you need to check out some materials on your dummy account, you have a card that will quickly bring up your account. Some of the ways that the interlibrary loan account have been created is um, as interlibrary loan um, separate words, um, all capitals, um, all running one word, and I actually didn't make a, an image of it, but there are a lot of people who actually just put ILL. Um, the one um, standard is to put your two-letter code somewhere in there. Um, that way, other people who pull up interlibrary loan know that it, 
uh, SG is not their ILL um, account that they're pulling up. Um, and it doesn't matter where you put it. Um, I noticed that we have a couple that um, have their two letter code at the end and we have some that the two letter code is at the beginning. Um, we do have a couple libraries that don't use their two letter code. Um, keep in mind that the barcode on the left um, shows that library's prefix. So in a pinch, if I was searching and I pulled up interlibrary, I could at least look at the prefix and go, no, that's, that's not my library. Um, the only thing that I do consider to be truly important with this image is that um, your loan type, your person is interlibrary loan. Um, when you list it as an adult, it does not have as long of a uh, circulation time. And when you check out items for share it, it often um, requires uh, at least two extra weeks uh, to travel out on the courier and then to travel back. Can I interrupt for a second? Crystal? Sure. Um, make sure that your library has circulation rules for interlibrary loan um, because each library has their own circulation rules. Um, if you don't know, contact me or contact Crystal or contact Margie and we can let you know what circula circulation rules you have. Thank you, Mary Beth. Okay, so let's see. Do I need to take this to the back? Stop video. Can you see the faces over mine? Or can you just see the Koha? Okay, good. <laughs> my, uh, my participants are over the top of it, so I wanted to make sure that I um, wasn't showing you guys just a list of faces. Okay, I am gonna make a dummy account. Um, we have a new library that will be joining us this year. Um, it is USD 431 Hoisington Schools. So how we're gonna go about making their dummy patron is we'll go to new patron and we'll scroll down to interlibrary loan. And then in our surname, we're gonna put, now the thing about schools is um, they have a four, three letter code. We still say two letter code, but it is actually a three letter code. So their three letter code is 431, just like um, USD 224 is 224. Um, and then I'm going to put, um, interlibrary loan as their surname. Now at this point, you only need to fill in anything red. So you don't feel like you have to fill out all of this other information. They are asking for the zip code, so I am going to put the Hoisington zip code in, which is 67544. And then a little bit further down, they've got a card number. Now I get to be the person who puts in the very first card number that they have. Um, for their patrons. So they are going to be the prefix 27431. Okay. Um, library needs to be their library, Hoisington School. They are interlibrary loan. And then the final information is the username. Um, when you put in the OPAC staff login for a dummy account, that can be kind of confusing because you may think you need to put in the real um, login information to, to keep track of it. But since it's a dummy account, you will never log into this account because you have your own staff account. Um, so what I'm going to do for this one is I'm just gonna put USD 431. Here you can just put in a generic password and then click save. No. <laughs> Um, once you're done, you should be able to save. It shouldn't ask you to do anything else. And they have created an interlibrary loan. So when they train on interlibrary loan, they should be able to check out all of their materials to this dummy account before sending it out um, to the library. Okay. Um, before I move on to our next topic, um, does anybody have any questions about dummy accounts? I don't see any in the chat box yet, but we'll give them a little bit of time. I will say that I am going to add a list of libraries and their two or three letter codes um, into that handouts folder that I linked in the chat box. So it will be there later today. Terrific, thank you. Okay, so we, all have, we have the flip side of having items going out, we have materials coming in. So in this situation, you make a request and then the book arrives from another library and um, you're ready to check it out to your patron. 
um, checking out an item that you received from another library on Share It, and it needs to go out to your patron. So when we um, normally hand these out, some libraries just hand it over to them and rely on Share It to um, keep track of when it becomes overdue and when it comes in, and they may even include um, their patrons information in the, in the share it request so that they know who has it. Um, if you want to follow your workflow that you're currently using, that is perfectly fine. Um, this is um, a nice way to um, be able to track on a patron's account and I'll explain why temporary records are so beneficial. Oh, and the definition is um, a temporary record is deleted when the book returns from the patron. That's why it's a temporary record and not a dummy record. Okay, a temporary record versus a dummy record. A temporary record is entered into the catalog with its information about the item being added. And so the image on the left kind of reminds me of a temporary record. You've got a title, you've got a book, it's obviously only there for a brief period of time and you know that you know that it's um, you know that it, the title information of the book, I, I can just tell it like glancing at it, I believe it's a handmaiden's tale. Um, and once um, the patron returns it, that record is typically deleted, and that is the end of your ILL transaction with that item. A dummy record is a blank record that sits in the catalog and sometimes has an item type attached to it. Um, sometimes there will be a few uh, dummy records with holdings that say DVD, book, play away, or it will actually be a dummy record that says play away, DVD, or book. And they stay in the catalog and are not deleted. So the image on the right reminded me of our dummy records that sit in the catalog um, that people can see and, and um, they, they don't get deleted. Um, temporary records are, they're, they're, they're the most current pra practice right now. And the reason why is because there was a time that we had no automation on our libraries. And then we started having a few libraries that were automated, but still many of the other libraries did not have barcodes. Well now pretty much everybody who's automated that is going to be automated. And if an item comes in from Share It, um, you can use the barcode that's on the item to actually create the temporary record. So then when the item comes back, if your clerk doesn't catch that it's not your item, and they go to scan it in, it will pop up with a little yellow field that says that it's an ILL item and the temporary record is ready to be deleted. Um, it's also um, an extra step if you like to keep track of your patron accounts. If you have a patron who walks in and um, says they've turned in their ILL item and it shows that it's checked out on Pathfinder and it's still shown checked out on Share It, there's a good possibility that this patron still has the item. Um, finally, having pre-created dummy records that, hand, that are in our catalog, um, they tend to build up and have a few problems for the following reasons. Um, let me show you really quick what um, a dummy record looks like. I, as a, um, a researcher, and especially an interlibrary loan, I was um, interested in searching for um, interlibrary loan books. And when I did my search, um, it was a very, situa very strange situation. Okay, so you've got two items that have the words interlibrary loan in them, but the rest of these materials are all just dummy records. And this, um, this example is one dummy record that has 143 holdings on it. So that's what I mean by um, having a blank record. Um, if we open this up and we were to take a peek at some of these, um, these holdings in the last time that they were, that was not the right one. Actually, it might have been. If we go to the interlibrary loan items and as they are, um, if you scroll down through them, you'll find that it goes all the way back to 2013. So when we have items in here that are all the way back to 2013, um, it 
shows that we have materials that are starting to fill up our database. And if we have all 50 of our libraries that choose 50 um, holdings for each of their items, then we'll have thousands of empty um, dummy records in our catalog. So that's one of the reasons we want to go with a temporary record because not only that, your temporary records are going to look a little bit more like this guy. And those are some pretty good um, records to have in our system. Let's see. And the final reason is um, if you do have dummy records and it just says DVD and you have one patron who checks out two different DVDs, um, it, it can be confusing at times for the librarian to determine which record is which DVD title. Um, and creating a temporary record will help eliminate that confusion. Okay, I'm gonna quickly run through creating a temporary record on um, my presentation and then we'll actually create one. First thing you'll want to do is go to your cataloging and create a new record and then you'll use this fast add. Fast add is only intended for uncatalogued items which are your ILL items. So you don't want to use fast add if you're cataloging an item that has an ISBN or um, a Library of Congress number or has a good title and author and you're planning to keep it in your catalog. Um, I start backwards. Um, when you hit when you hit the fast add, um, it um, gives you these fields, these zero, three, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And I tend to go backwards because it's just easiest for me to remember. Um, you'll want to make sure to put ILL borrowed in your item type. Um, this is what's going to help make your item invisible. Also, by selecting hide and OPAC, it will uh, make the item invisible as well. Um, you'll go, you'll skip eight, seven, six, and five, and you can go down to 300 and just give yourself enough information to remember exactly what, what this item is. Did you get an audio book? Was it a large print book? Um, and this is for your benefit. And then you need to add in, um, in the zero fields, you just click in the five field and it will um, po automatically pop up with the information. So you don't have to add anything in there. Um, in the 99, you'll put your call number. In the 100, you'll put your, um, author and in the title you'll put the title. Now since this is a temporary record it's really not picky how you put your um, author information in, um, capitalization of your title, um, because typically when you have a catalog record it will have um, King comma Stephen, but in this situation since it's going to be deleted you can put Stephen King, whatever is easiest for you. Um, after that, you will click the save button and then it'll pop up with your holdings. So we just created a record and now we need to add the actual holdings for your physical item that you're about to give to your patron. Um, make sure that you have your location, sublocation is your library. And then it's going to request that you make sure that you put your call number in and this is where you scan your barcode and then your ILL borrowed is very important for your Koha item type to make sure that it remains um, invisible to your um, to the OPAC, which is the online public access. Um, I did discover when I was adding temporary records that if I have an item that only has nine numbers, it adds your prefix to it. And that is just a setting because if there's nine numbers, it thinks it needs to add your prefix to reach our 14 numbers. Um, I, if, you have a, if you have a barcode that's 14, if you have it that's 10 or nine, it's all um, going to save. Um, it's only when you put in the nine that it'll actually um, add numbers to the beginning of it. Um, if the library doesn't have a barcode um, and you are trying to decide how best to put a put a barcode in here. Um, this is the point you can certainly use a barcode from your library that's on a three by five card and you'll just simply scan it and it will um, and then put it put a note on it letting oh put it in with your ILL paperwork and that way when um, you go to check it back in you've got all the paperwork you know exactly which which item it is. And um, for those of you who um, don't do a lot of ILL. Um, your paperwork would be the paperwork that you take out of the book and usually the shipping label that you set aside before you hand the item to the patron. Um, if you create a temporary record this way, when your patron goes to search for this item, um, this is what they see. So 
let's say you have a patron who has requested this really new exotic Blu-ray disc and nobody in Pathfinder has this item. So you request it through ShareIt and the item arrives and um, you want to check it out to that patron. Um, patron number two is interested in this item and they decide to go search the catalog for it rather than, than them seeing it and it not realizing that it's an ILL item and will disappear, um, this pops up so that they um, aren't able to place holds on it. And that will hopefully benefit all of the libraries. Um, when you go to check this item out, this is the screen that you will see. Um, as you can tell, it's got um, the item type of ILL borrowed and you should be able to tell that this is, the, this is the temporary record that you created. Now, there are a lot of libraries that insert ILL before the title um, there at some place so that in the information when they look at it, they can see that it is an ILL item. Um, and whatever is easiest for your library is what I recommend. This is just your, your basic um, information that you want to put in for a temporary record. When your patron returns the item, you'll check it in and it'll pop up with this message saying, return to ILL, please delete the temporary record. Now, if you're a one person library, this may not be very helpful, but we do have um, a lot of libraries that have clerks that work different days and maybe has one specific ILL person. And so if the clerk at the front happens to check in an item, this is a useful tool for them to know to take this book and, uh, or item and bring it back to the ILL desk and uh, prepare to get it returned. Okay, I'm gonna show you really quick how we um, create a temporary record. And we're gonna start by going up to cataloging. Okay, click on new record. And here's our fast ad. And I always go backwards, so I select the 900s. Go to ILL borrowed, and we will hide this item in the OPAC. So we don't need to add anything to eight, seven, six, five. We'll go down to three. Um, for this, we're going to go ahead and say we're doing an audiobook. Last time I did a large print book. And then we click in the 005, it just pops up. Um, you can put in the ISBN, which is the, uh, the 13 digit number on the back of your book or inside the cover if you want to, but it is not required to save this. And we'll put in the author and we'll put in the title. And then it will ask for the 099 because I always hit save and forget that one field. And that's just simply the call number that we're, we're using. Um, and this may also be where you want to put your ILL. Um, I know that there are many different places that you can put this. Um, that is one of the places. If it's the same title of anything else, it's going to ask you if you have a duplicate record. And um, you'll want to always click on no when you're making a temporary record which will then move us over to making our holdings. Um, start with your location and your sublocation. You've got your call number already populated and it's already changed it to ILL borrowed. So I will want to put in the barcode. We're gonna, th we're gonna think that this one, this library uses 10 digits. And we'll click on add item. So when we're ready to, this item is for Crystal Hutchinson. That'll be our, our patron. So she walks in and she says, I got the call that um, you have my ILL item. We'll just pull her up. Okay. And then we'll plug in that, um, record and the nice thing the, the barcode the nice thing about if you have that back of the book you can actually scan it when you're going to hand it out um, when I very first started doing interlibrary loan uh, years ago um, it, rather than using a card we scanned the barcode of the book which is the UPC label um, it wasn't even it wasn't even a, a barcode that was the libraries um, and that was very useful um, for temporary records 
So then we see that the item is um, checked out to our patron and the patron comes back several days or a few weeks later and has it ready to check back in. Okay, and then it shows the um, yellow box that says return to ILL, please delete the temporary item. And um, you'll wanna at that point, click on it, click on normal. When in doubt, normal it out. That's how you get to get to um, a record if you're having a hard time um, locating it. And then I check marked right here next to the item. And then I'm gonna click, click on delete selected item. And it's going to pull it up and say, this is the one you want to delete. And then to get rid of this temporary record, I'll cl click on delete record if no items remain. I'll click on delete selected item. And it is gone. So if we were to search for that barcode, it would no longer be in here. And also that, that record of an audio book of Stephen King's is no longer um, in, the, in the catalog. And that cleans it right up, doesn't build up in our database, and um, keeps things going quickly for us. Okay, do we have any questions about making or using the um, temporary records? I don't see any chat, but let's give them a couple minutes to type something in. I know some libraries have um, dummy records set up with the cards all ready to go. And I don't want people to feel like they need to change their current layout. But if um, you find that method to be cumbersome or maybe you don't use that method um, and you do want to use it this way, um, this is a very, very uh, fast and easy way to um, get your materials out to your patron and be able to keep an eye on uh, what the status of it is in Pathfinder. I have a lot of faith in Share It, so um, if an item is in Share It and I um, may or may not have the information in Pathfinder, I still trust that Share It's going to be able to let me know when something's overdue or um, has been returned. Um, moving into the next part of uh, my session, um, I want to talk a little bit about our workflow when you place a hold versus the workflow when you get a request from ShareIt. This is often talked about when we have um, an ILL gathering. What do you do if you find an item on ShareIt and then you realize that it's uh, also located in Pathfinder? Um, the, the standard is to go back to Pathfinder and go ahead and place a hold. But why? Why do we want to turn around and go back and place a hold if we're already in ShareIt? So um, let me show you quickly what the process is when we make a request on PIL, which is our Pathfinder interlibrary loan. You make the request on PIL. Um, that's your patron placing a hold. The following day, um, the lending librarian goes to check the holds. They pull the item off of the shelf and they check it in and it triggers the hold and says transfer to this library. So they right away print the transfer sheet, put it in the courier bag and send it to the library. Now that borrowing library can look on the computer and see that this item is in transit to their library. They know it's been put on the courier. Um, when the item arrives, they change the status, they check it in, which tells um, the lending library, hey, your book's arrived, it's safe and sound at the other library. At that point, um, they'll let the patron know that the materials are there for them. And um, when the patron comes in, they'll check it out to the patron. Um, if it sits at that library for 48 hours before the patron comes in, um, that lending library still knows that, that that item is waiting at that library. The patron then checks out the item, uses it for a period of time, and then returns it. When they return it, um, the librarian checks it in and it triggers that it needs to be transferred back to the lending library. They'll then put it in the courier and the lending library knows that the item is um, on its way back to their back to their library and is probably on the courier. Um, once it gets back to the home library, they check it in and the circuit is complete. So it's very, very transparent and um, it's um, very easy as far as um, all you do is check it in and it brings up um, the information. Uh, also, when you print, um, all you print is that little transfer slip, which is a lot like when you print your slips for checking out. 
Um, the other the other searching method of going through ShareIt is you make a request on ShareIt, then the lending library changes the status to shipped, prints the page, writes the due date on it, folds it up, and um, puts it on the courier. And so the borrowing library knows that it's been changed to ship, so it is on its way. When it arrives at the borrowing library, they change the status to received. And at this point, that's where it stays. It sits at received. So the lending library doesn't really know how long it sits in the library before it checks out to the patron. It doesn't know um, when it does get checked out to the patron how many weeks use they have. And it doesn't know if um, the item goes overdue because the patron's a little late turning it in. Um, it stays at received until the borrowing library changes the status. Um, once the item comes back and they bag it up, then it will um, be changed back to returned um, by the borrowing library and they will put it back on the courier. So once it changes to returned, then the lending library knows, okay, it's back on the courier and it's going to arrive at, at my library at some point. Um, the lending library finally receives the item back through the courier and changes the status to complete and that completes the circuit. So the transparency we have with Pathfinder um, makes ShareIt much more difficult to track when you want to make a request on ShareIt. So that's why when you have a library who wants to um, have another library cancel a request on ShareIt and make a hold on PIL, it's less paperwork, there's less computer work, and um, it's very clear to track their item when they send it out. So um, this is the workflow for Pathfinder Central and the workflow for ShareIt. Oh, and there is a situation where um, an item is lost um, on Pathfinder and, and you have to choose ShareIt, and that is perfectly acceptable. If you are trying to access something in Pathfinder and only one library has it and you have not been able to get it, or an item is damaged and cannot be sent, feel free to go over to ShareIt and make that request, even if you do find something in Pathfinder. I do have a comment in the chat. It's um, from Gail. She says it's also easier to track your statistics on Pathfinder. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pathfinder does all the work for you. You run a report at the end of the year and boom, there are your stats. Whereas with ShareIt, it's best recommended that you keep track by having hash marks on a paper or keeping an Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet, some form of um, keeping track of, of how much you've sent out and how much you've requested on ShareIt. So Pathfinder is definitely the easier of the two. Um, some housekeeping and then some question and answer time. The rotating uh, book collection that goes out to your libraries. And if you borrow an item from another library, so an item that is not actually owned by your library, do not lend those out on ShareIt. Um, if a library requests, places a hold for an item in Pathfinder, um, we have a policy set up in Pathfinder where you start lending your new materials after one month. Um, on ShareIt, you do not have to lend your, your fiction items for six months. Your nonfiction items are four months. So if you borrow something after a month from a library and send it out on ShareIt, then um, that might not coincide with what the circulation stats and rules are for that um, owning library. Um, Another, another reason for rotating is um, they come out to your library and you are, a, um, you, are, you are the interlibrary loan. We are loaning these materials to you. And um, when you lend those out, um, the, the biggest issue is they don't come back to you. And that's actually the why of this. Um, if you send something out on, interlibrary loan and it's not your item, it doesn't always make it back to your library. It'll go back to its home library, which is CKLS or that library that you borrowed an item from and then sent out on ShareIt. Um, when that happens, you don't get to close your circuit because the paperwork and everything goes back to the home library. And so it ends up being more difficult um, on your end for ShareIt as well. So the overall rule is if it's not yours, don't lend it on ShareIt. Um, 
and I wanted to conclude by making sure, I know I say it over and over and over again, but um, I want you to make sure that you do what works best for your library. You may find a combination of creating a dummy account and maybe still you having a, a dummy record may work best for your library. Um, you might find that these are absolutely the best and easiest for you to use an ILL and you may switch over and you may currently be doing it. But um, this webinar is not intended to tell you what you have to do. It's just showing you the best practices in this shared catalog. Um, we all share this catalog and um, we want to make sure to keep our database clean and we want to make sure that um, we're all serving our patrons as quickly as possible. So I just want to thank you for attending my webinar and um, I'm happy to take any questions or concerns that you may have um, involving ILL. I don't see anything in the chat yet, but we'll give you guys some time to type in there. Um, you can also feel free to unmute your mic and ask over the microphone. Um, either way is acceptable. I will mention that on the thank you page, um, the imagery I used, I pulled from Wikimedia. Um, it's um, Commons imagery. So I wanted to make sure that I um, had a link to that as well. There is one question. Do we send um, rotating books on PILL, Pathfinder Interlibrary Loan? If it's, and I would say the answer is yes. Um, it's still in Pathfinder. It's gonna find its way home. Pathfinder does a much better um, way of tracking where the books are. Am I muted? Are you, are you, are you? I can hear you. Okay. Um, so yes, Pathfinder, um, Interlibrary Loan, you can send rotating books out on Pathfinder Interlibrary Loan. If you want that rotating book to come back to you, you don't think um, your patrons have had enough uh, but on your shelf, you can always place a hold on it so that it will come back to you. Otherwise, it'll probably stay at that library or it'll come back to CKLS. That was an excellent question. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, that concludes my webinar. I do want to um, show how to take a peek at um, our Tuesday topics on YouTube, but if you have um, patrons that are waiting or you have some stuff you need to get your day started, um, feel free to lead the meeting and um, take care of the rest of your library duties and thank you for coming. Um, I have the YouTube set up. Um, this is my personal YouTube, so that way I'm not affiliated with Central Kansas Library System and um, it's exactly like if you were to go to YouTube. So I'm going to go to the Central Kansas Library System and we are putting all of our webinars onto this account. So far we have eight videos. Okay, so down, down here right here shows our different playlists. Um, we are separating them by type so that it's easy for you to access. Um, our first one is the CKLS meetings. Um, the next playlist is Tuesdays with CKLS, which is where mine will be posted. We already have Gail's uh, weeding web, uh, webinar in there. Um, the third one is CKLS tutorials. And as you can see, the first one listed is if your bookmark disappears um, from Share It, how to go about um, get logging back in if you have troubles logging in to share it. Um, and then we also have CKLS workshops. And if we have new tutorials by Bywater Solutions, which is our support um, system, we've been putting them in here. And by new, I mean like late 2017 and forward. Um, that way it is current with the most recent updates. And there's a lot of useful information in there as well. So if you um, were curious as to where to find those webinars, that's where that is. And I will send out a link to the video as soon as I get it uploaded, hopefully by the end of today, if not by the end, before the end of the week. Um, and I'll have a link directly to that video. Um, if you have a YouTube uh, station or you have a Google account, you can always just subscribe to CKLS and you'll be notified when new videos come up as well. Um, there was just a little bit more clarif clarification on rotating books. Um, just because your sublocation 
uh, says your library or your current location says your library on a rotating book, once you send it out of your library, that current location changes to whichever library you sent it to. So if you want your rotating books back after you sent them on pill, make sure you place a hold on them and then they will come back to you. Thank you, Crystal and Mary Beth. You're very welcome. It's always fun to see our librarians. Especially when we don't have to drive in ice. Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. If you have any more questions or think of them later, feel free to email either Crystal or myself and we will answer those as best we can. Um, I'll also um, uh, archive the chat, so any of the chat information will also be archived as well. So um, everything will be saved. And if you guys need to watch it again, you have it. If you just want the slides, you have those. And um, I think we're all set. Bye. <laughs>